Good evening. I wrap scene and here we are. I'm putting this out very early. It is Monday and we are now at the 30th of October, 2023, and I'm at 4.45 p.m. Central Time. I normally like to put these out after five o'clock, but I have somewhere I have to be tonight. So if I don't get it now, we don't get it done. All the auto workers have now gone into and done their deal. Now, let me tell you about inflation. You're, you're talking a car, the new cost per labor is going to go up over $3,000 a car starting a year within the year, uh, taking it from now it gets ra uh, ratified in that first year about that. And it could end up uh, going up $4,000, $5,000 by the end of this deal. And you think that's not inflationary? You're going to be paying it, right? The, the Auto companies will do their best to save money, but they can't make that type of money up. That, that isn't going to happen. So where does this push everything? I mean, it, don't you feel at some point between the, if you look, UPS drivers, I, I'm just cracking up what's going on here and how wages are exploding. And I'm not saying people aren't worth it. That is not what this is about. It's about inflation. And that is the point that we're dealing with. We have to have a way to do something. Now, we're going to get a series of numbers this week, and you've got to be careful. You've got three central bankers coming at you, and they're fighting inflation. Tomorrow, we get the Bank of Japan. Wednesday, we get our bank, the uh, Federal Reserve. We get the Bank of England. Then, also Wednesday morning, we hear from U, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen telling us what's the quarterly refunding? You know, is it going to be that $114 billion? That's even a bigger number. Where's that money coming from other than going to the auctions and continuing to try to get uh, private money to pay up for it because you're not getting a lot of foreign money buying the way that they did? Then this week, you got the JOLTS data and JOBS data. Folks, buckle in. It's a very rough road right now, so please be ready for that. Today was a strong day in the stock market, though. You're up 500 points in the Dow. In the S&P, you're up 48 points. You're up 150 in the NASDAQ. And the laggard is still the uh, Russell. I don't see it doing that well. Gold only up $7. You know, I, I, I get people writing me over the weekend, you know that gold, uh, the last trade to the day, that, that settlement's way off. Let me explain to everybody. Settlement times and futures almost across the board happen much earlier, got that much earlier than the close. 12.30 p.m. in the metals, typically. The set, that's the settlement when they determine it. 4 o'clock p.m. Central Time, these are Central Time, is when the last trade happens. This goes back to years ago when the, we had the London uh, mark, the, the, you had the London gold ring setting spot gold prices. This is all archaic stuff. I don't think it's needed anymore. And I wish the exchanges would get away from that and follow the stock market. The last trade is the last trade. But they want to keep hedge business in a certain way. I don't know that it's necessary. A lot of things get done and they're, they're there and I don't understand them because anybody today, it's a 24 hour a day market, they could pick it up and hedging could be done, but they want to make it with what's called the ring trade, which is the way they used to do the spot settlements. All right. When you look at the gold market, it has come roaring back from this low all the way back up to the 2000 level. So as it fell from 2024 all the way down here, you do realize that this price, you're $20 away from the highest high. You wouldn't believe it, but it's a combination of events that happened with inflation talk. And of course, since October 7th, the war bid is in the marketplace and it's been straight up. Just be aware, corrections, nothing grows to the sky, corrections do set in. When we take a look at the chart, it's actually been quite orderly. You have one gap in the chart and the market went the rest of the way. Interesting. Normally you try to fill a gap. Will it? Might not do that. Uh, two of them I, I would think you're going to make a try for. We then look at where the swing line is and it is doing its job. Now, the swing line is a study that I created when my, my son was 13. As I said, he's 25 years older than that now. And I, I it was a trick. I said, you can go to any uh, place and tell people what a trend is and what the risk is with the trend. And I have them draw the lines because I teach it in my course. Kaboom. 
and he could tell you what it is. It didn't matter what it was. I didn't care if it was a stock. They didn't have ETFs in those days, but they certainly had stocks and futures contracts. And I use it to this day, and it isn't the parlor trick. It tells me that until you take out 96460, you have the classic bull pattern of higher lows, higher highs in place. I then look to see where is the market in terms of moving averages. And we have the market where maybe the 18-day average is getting ready to get back over the 100, 1956.30. Maybe that happens later this week. It's certainly not going to happen in a day or so. The market has been able to stay over these averages because of the war. And that is very, very important. And we never know when we go to bed in America what we're going to wake up in the morning to in this war. Everybody's always fearful. Did Iran get themselves involved? Uh, did Russia pull another whatever Russia does and get themselves involved? We don't know where we're at with this. We know Israel's not going to give up. We know Israel, if you were watching Netanyahu's statements today, forget this idea that they're going to give a pause and all this. It isn't going to happen. They're given no quarter. It's called war. And they're after all this. Uh, I don't think he buys into the idea that Amos wants to give back these, uh, these hostages so quickly. They took them for a reason. They didn't just grab people and say, we'll take a few. They took 239. There's a reason. If you think they're coming back soon, I think you don't understand the mindset of terrorists. Uh, it's not, hey, we'll give them back to you. You guys go back across your border. Don't kill us. Don't do any more. You think that's going to happen? Okay. Um, higher lows, higher highs. Will the market reach up over time to the upper Bollinger Band? I don't know. May not. All right. The market's already built in an awful lot. And as long as you don't get the bad players getting more aggressive in here and it would stay like this, does gold have to go a lot further? You'll keep the bid in it, but does it have to go a lot further? Get another player involved. Pick up something from Hezbollah. Pick up more out of uh, Syria, Iraq. That changes the game. And of course, the monster in the room is Iran if they decide to actually deploy troops and or ships or whatever. But them just sitting there directing the fighting, that isn't going to make it happen. We know they're directing the fighting. In the gold market, you have the embedded reading. An embedded reading occurs when the two lines, the red and the blue, go sideways over 80. And until the red closes under 79, it tells me the pros want to buy breaks. And the hardest break to buy is the first move over key moving averages. But that's been what's going on. I'm going to attribute it to the war factor. So I would say 1983 and a half is the near term support. I don't put a heck of a lot of faith in it because generally that's not the best place to come in. I think you're going to wait for a catalyst to get the 18 and the 100 day getting closer and give you a better support number. The gold-silver ratio, silver is again getting itself stronger than gold, and you're seeing the correction take place. Now, is it going to be able to get under that and mount something? Each time it's tried it recently, it's had a big failure. So until it changes that, no, nah, don't, don't be the first guy on the block. First guy on the block each time has got, been getting killed. In the silver, you had the lower highs, and now, right now, you got the higher lows. But like I just said, look at this average, the 100-day. You're right into it. Right above you is the combination of this light gray and the deep black. That's the 200-day average in the upper Bollinger Band. Can you go there and get through it? Sure, you could. Is it easy? Nope. Is it hard to stay over that on the first run? Yep. Are you getting into overbought territory? You're knocking on the door. You have 67 readings. When we reopen tonight, if you're up, you're probably in the overbought territory. In the copper market, I read an interesting article first thing this morning, four in the morning when I was reading it, that China has been depleting its over the ground copper reserves. And they've done that because as their economy was slowing down, they just didn't keep buying. They decided to let things run down, and now they've got to go build them back up. That's bullish, this market. But it's certainly not for a guy like me bullish enough to tell my client, hey, buy over that Bollinger Band, when only 5% of the time do you stay over it. I think I'll pass, but I do think that the market it gets interesting around the 360 level again. So I'm going to be watching that. 
in the platinum market? Well, this is the auto deal, all right? All three automakers have signed the monster contract and now it's just gotta be ratified and on they go. Inflationary as can be, but now that's why the market got back up and over the 18 week average and started throwing out the signals that are now bullish. I still wouldn't have you buy over a Bollinger Band on the first challenge of the 100 day, it could go higher. So it's now got the combination of a bit of the war in there, but certainly the demand's gonna come back for the product. In the dollar, what is this week? Three central bankers, the Treasury, Jolt's data, Jobs data, ADP, I think is there too. And you want to get involved in the dollar. I'll let you do that. And it would be the same in the uh, euro. So I put this all together on these charts behind me and the quote boards. And I say, well, what do you do? You join me first thing in the morning. And I start throwing out the trades in the different markets for you. Today we were in the wheat market. It's one of the new trades that we got off. I think I put out this morning in the spider eight different trade recommendations. So you're getting quite a few of them because the markets are there. They're offering it in different areas. The charts will look like that. They, they will have these black. Let me do that again. They will look this way. Let's see if I can get this to stop where I want it. Yeah, there it is. They're going to have more studies than you're used to seeing. I like the black background. They're going to jump off at you. And then I start telling you on a weekly and a monthly chart what I am seeing each morning. And then we're looking for longer term and shorter term. What can we get done? We start off talking about entry and exit points, the day's fundamentals, what's coming up, just the way we're talking, specific ideas on the trade, where to move with it. I cover all the market parts for you and try to give you this in a way that makes some sense. Got 54 years of doing it and I'm still here for a reason. If it didn't, uh, if it didn't sit well with people, I guess I wouldn't be here that long. That's one way to look at it, right? And as I said, longer term and shorter term ideas. So it's easy to see. Just go to our website under the word research and away you go. Could it be easier? I'm I Rapstein. Remember, there'll be an icon up here. Just give that a click. It'll take you there at any point and you have a good day.